Greetings, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you today about the clinical management of the infected autoimmune conundrum in patients with autoimmune encephalopathies. And what this really means is you're going to encounter patients who are both uh, in an autoimmune encephalopathy process and dealing with a pathogen burden. And so there may be what seem like competing agendas there immunologically. I'm going to walk you through how to manage these cases in such a way that you've got both the autoimmune component properly managed and the infectious component properly managed. Okay, so most of these encephalitis patients also have infection. They're not just patients with an encephalitis they are patients who also have uh, an infectious process. And that presents the problem that you seem to feel like you want to quiet down the immune response from the point of view of quieting down the autoimmunity, but then that's going to give the infection an advantage. On the other hand, it seems like you want to go after the infection by cranking up the immune response. So that's problematic. So autoimmunity, you want to dampen it, right? Infection, you want to crank it up. So how do you do it? What do you do, okay? So it seems like you can't do both, and our job is going to be to sort out by the end of this, uh, a little less than an hour, how to do both, okay? Now, it's, impo it's important that you set proper expectations with these folks. It's not gonna be one magic thing. They're not standing at the gate of a garden that's locked with a ring of keys trying things one at a time, right? Is it zinc? No. Is it this other thing? No, it's not the right model, right? You don't want to hunt for the one magic key. It's much more like you're building an engine or rebuilding an engine. You've got a whole bunch of different variables and you've got to get a whole bunch of them right to turn the tide on the problem. So I'm sure all of you who work with patients know they come in hunting for the one magic bullet, the one magic missing piece. That's not how to run the case, okay? so. You've got to match the level of complexity of what you're doing to the level of complexity of the biology, right? If the biology has a dozen different things going on, you've got to be striking at that level. You can't be thinking, I'll do one thing to deal with all of these things. So here's what we want to focus on today. We want to deal with the autoimmune inflammatory coactivation and the impact of inflammation on things like autoimmune flares and very importantly, neuron microglial interaction. Microglial cells are macrophages that live in the brain. They're at the center of the whole thing. Microglial cells munch neurons, they phagocytize neurons, and they can have an antigen presentation function where they present fragments of neuronal debris to invading T cells instead of what they're supposed to do, which is kill the invading T cells. So that's pretty crucial stuff that we have to learn how to manage. Then we want to talk about T-cell polarization because that's going to be central to quieting down autoimmunity and central to pathogen surveillance. And we want to talk then briefly at the end about a classic clinical mistake that clinicians make over and over again. It seems like the right thing to do, but if you do it first instead of doing it second, then the risk is that the patient will get much worse. And then we'll talk at the end about applications, although you'll see that we'll be talking about applications all the way through. Now, the first thing to tackle is how are inflammation and autoimmunity connected? So you have the NF kappa B that is at the center of the inflammation process, and it's in a coactivation cycle with this thing called STAT3, signal transducer and activator of transcription 3. And STAT3 is at the center of the autoimmune flare activation process. So here we have the original review from the New England Journal of Medicine, 1997 when they were first figuring out NF-kappa-B. And so they say NF-kappa-B is triggered by a bunch of pro-inflammatory signals that arrive at a cell, and inside the cell in the cytosol, the NF-kappa-B gets activated. It goes into the nucleus and turns on gene expression of a bunch of different inflammatory substances, including TNF-alpha and IL-1-beta. Now, TNF-alpha and IL-1-beta are very inflammatory. They drive neutrophils into tissue, which is a primary starting point of the inflammatory process. 
TNF alpha and IL-1 beta also activate NF kappa B again. So the authors describe this as the primary amplifying loop of the inflammatory process. So that's the role of NF kappa B. It's a primary driver of inflammation. Now that means anything that turns on NF kappa B turns on inflammation. What about STAT3? Here we have a naive T cell. And if these cytokines, things like interleukin-6 or 21 or 23, if they are around in the tissue, then they will turn on STAT3. That will cause that naive T cell, the blue one in the middle, to turn into a TH17 cell. And then it's going to start pouring out those very inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-21, interleukin-17, A and F, interleukin-22, and they drive the tissue destruction in the autoimmune process. Now, you notice that I just put a line through where it said autoimmunity. The reason I did that is this is a 2008 paper. And in 2008, there was still a holdover of the idea that TH1 cells drove autoimmunity. We're going to talk later in the discussion about the fact that TH1 cells don't drive autoimmunity. That's a very important point to make. We'll talk about it in some detail later because it's pretty crucial to the clinical understanding of what to do. Okay, so now there's a primary balance between TH17 and regulatory T cells. And if you inhibit STAT3 with things like curcumin or resveratrol, vitamin A, and so on, sulforaphanes, all those kinds of things, if you inhibit STAT3, then that naive T cell is going to become a regulatory T cell or a Treg, and that's going to promote immune tolerance. Generally speaking, that's a really, really good idea because immune tolerance means you don't attack your own tissue. So that's pretty good as far as it goes. We'll see that you can't do that first. You've got to do it second. That'll be the last thing we talk about. But it's a very important thing to do because promoting tolerance so you don't attack your own tissue is very, very central to quieting down the autoimmunity. Now, what does the TH17 cell do? Well, we saw the fact, whoops, excuse me, we saw the fact that it drives the production of those cytokines like interleukin 17A and F and IL-21, IL-22. One of the main things that that does is it drives neutrophils into tissue. And when you see on a complete blood count that the neutrophil percentage is drifting up, 68%, 72%, 75%, this process is likely going on. Now, you will sometimes see patients for whom the CBC is flipped in terms of neutrophils and lymphocytes, where the neutrophil percentage is 45 and the lymphocyte percentage is 45, let's say. So instead of being 60% neutrophils and 30% lymphocytes, those two numbers are drifting toward each other. Oftentimes, that simply means that the adaptive immune system is very activated. So that may mask over the neutrophilia since the, the, the T and B cells are so expanded. But when you do see it, when you do see neutrophil percentages quite high, unless the patient has an acute infection, the chances are you're looking at TH17 cell activation. Now, these TH17 cells make interleukin 17A and F, and the interleukin 17 drives all of these cells to generate all of these products, you'll notice first on the list there, my the macrophages are IL-1 beta, TNF alpha, IL-6, CRP. All of those effects drive things like inflammation, blood vessel damage, destruction of the extracellular matrix, bone erosion. So you see a lot of osteoporosis in patients with autoimmune disease, cartilage damage, and so on. And all of that drives all of these autoimmune conditions. It's interesting toward the bottom of the list there, notice that you see periodontal disease. So it's common to see in a patient, for example, with rheumatoid arthritis, to see dreadful periodontal disease, or the same thing with MS or Crohn's or other kinds of things like that. This mechanism of TH17 cells making too much interleukin-17 is common to the autoimmune diseases. So if you have an autoimmune encephalitis, this is what you're grappling with as well. Not, not only this, but in large measure this. Now, this is going to drive 
systemic inflammatory process that will drive brain inflammatory process and create problems for neuron microglial interactions, which we'll talk about. Okay, so this is just one of many references on the synergistic relationship between NF-kappa B and STAT3. So the bottom line then is that when you have activation of NF-kappa B, you're going to have activation of STAT3 and vice versa. So the key, key thing is, this whole laundry list of things you see on the left, people with metabolic issues or chronic stress chemistry or infection or dysbiosis in their intestine or reactions to foods or anything on that list, all of those things have the potential to drive NF-kappa B activation and therefore drive STAT3 activation. And this is why in patients with autoimmune encephalitis, it becomes important to attend to that laundry list of things on the left side. And you begin to say to yourself, this just seems chaotic. I got to deal with everything in the world for this patient to have a shot at being okay. But if you begin to realize what the convergent mechanism is through which the things on the left are affecting the autoimmunity on the right, you can begin to target very directly the inflammation itself as a way of trying to downregulate that attachment, that connection. Now, notice chronic stress is on that list. If you've got a kid with an autoimmune encephalitis, imagine being that kid. Imagine how stressful it is to be a child having these terrible problems and not really having adult psychological internal resources. In other words, if you were an adult having trouble, you would approach the process as an adult with the psychological resources of an adult, hopefully, right? So if a condition like this comes on in an adult who developmentally has the advantages psychologically of having been okay and having developed adult psychological resources internally, that's an advantage. But if the kid's nine, the kid has none of those advantages and it's going to be extremely, extremely stressful psychologically to be having those experiences and that's literally profoundly inflammatory. So that's, I think, worthy of attention. Notice also simple things like environment on that list. So for example, something simple like in the summertime in an urban setting, you know how they have the ozone alert during the weather report. On a bad ozone day, ozone exposure to the respiratory tract is profoundly inflammatory. So you have a kid, it's a summer day, and yet, you know, you're in London and you're in some other urban setting, and it's a bad ozone day, and you say to yourself, why is this kid more inflamed today? Why is this kid having more trouble today? All of those things are factors. You notice also O2 defects. Anything that diminishes delivery of oxygen, that means if the kid's anemic, well, you can't let your kid be anemic, because anemia means hypoxia, right? It means diminished tissue oxygenation, and that's inflammatory. So you have to inventory that whole list. Okay, so, so far, NF-kappa B and STAT3 both drive inflammatory tissue destruction. They are co-activators, and blocking STAT3 looks pretty good because it promotes regulatory T cells that promote immune tolerance. Now we have to talk about neuron microglial interactions. So here we have nature of use immunology, and the take home message here is that microglial cells are a specialized kind of macrophage. They are no different than other macrophages in their core being, but they are the ones specialized for function in the brain. Now, macrophages display remarkable plasticity. In other words, they can change how they function from cues in the tissue environment. Recognize that plasticity in immunology means flexibility. Plasticity in neurology means efficiency. So in neurology, plasticity means that a neuronal pathway becomes stronger and stronger with use. And so it becomes more and more robust and more dialed in. That's neurological plasticity. Immunological plasticity means the ability to change physiology in response to environmental cues. This is microglial phagocytosis of live neurons. This is from Nature Reviews Neuroscience. This is a paper to get and read over and over again. And the title tells you the whole thing, right? 
microglial phagocytosis, munching, of live neurons. So normal is that microglial cells phagocytize dead and dying neurons. That's normal, okay? So the problem comes in when microglial cells, instead of phagocytizing dead or dying neurons, they start gobbling, they start phagocytizing live but marginally viable neurons. That's the problem. So now, you start out with a brain that has the most brain cells when you're a baby, right? Huge number of brain cells, not that many connections, so you don't have that much function. Now, as time goes by, the connections among neurons get strengthened, and the neurons that don't get involved in that interconnectivity start to die off. And they have to be gotten rid of, or else they'll sit there, they'll sit there as like necrotic cells, and that's dreadful and terribly inflammatory. So the microglial cells, and by the way, there are 10 microglial cells for every neuron. So there are billions of neurons and even more billions, 10 times as many billions microglial cells. So your brain is your biggest immune organ. Okay. So now you've got these microglial cells. They are pruning the brain. So this is like sculpture. Okay. You start out like a big block of granite. There's no sculpture there. It's just a big block of granite. And you start to chip away at it, okay? You start to lose neurons. What emerges is a beautiful sculpture. It's the you ness of you, right? So your brain is this wonderful, wonderful thing. So the realization then is that there's nothing wrong with subtraction of neurons. Just like there's nothing wrong with subtraction when you start out with a block of granite and you get rid of granite to get the sculpture to emerge. That's okay, right? So the normal function of microglial cells in pruning and getting rid of dead neurons, we're all good with that, okay? But, same paper, microglia can also execute neuronal death by phagocytizing stressed but viable neurons. Now, under what circumstances would neurons be stressed but viable? Well, they would be stressed but viable, for example, in an inflammatory context in which the inflammation was interfering with the production of ATP by those neurons, and therefore interfering with their ability to signal robustly, okay? So the problem is, in an encephalitic brain, you've got neurons that are marginally functioning because of how inflamed the brain is. And the risk is that you will lose those neurons to excessively exuberant phagocytosis. And instead of sculpture, you'll get ice sculpture your brain will start to go away. And we absolutely do not want that. And we absolutely have to push back against that. Okay, so we're gonna do that. Now, how is this all working? How does it all get organized? How do neurons and microglial cells get this work done appropriately? So the big question is, how do the microglial cells know which are the dead neurons? Because if you've got microglial cells trying to determine among billions of neurons, which are the 10,000 neurons a day that are going to die and need to be pruned, how do those microglial cells know, okay, this is a dead neuron, this is a live neuron? And the answer is there are on and off signals put out by neurons that control microglia. So here's the paper. Neuronal on and off signals control microglia, and it does what the title says. So the neurons are not merely passive targets of microglia, but they control the microglial activity. So neurons then are key immune modulators in the brain. So here we have the off signals, things like transforming growth factor beta, and things like brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Now you will see, if you do um, uh, genomic testing, you will see that people will have things like uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms related to the ability to make brain-derived neurotrophic factor. This is common in the Nordic population. There are two core ways to increase BDNF. One is with the minutes past 30 in steady exercise like running or biking. And the other is heat. Now, the Nordic population, for whom genetic defects of BDNF are common, they are very attached to their 
saunas, right? They love saunas. They wouldn't think of having a day pass without a sauna because they're promoting BDNF and they feel better in their brains when they've got enough BDNF. So when you see a person with a gene defect related to BDNF production, get them in a sauna every day or get them doing exercise 45 minutes or an hour every day at that kind of loping pace where you feel like you go on forever. You know, get them on a treadmill or a stationary bike or get them out in the world exercise. Okay. The on signals are things like extracellular ATP. So when a cell dies and busts open and the ATP comes pouring out of the cytosol, that's an on signal. That's a signal of, hey, this is a dying neuron. Come gobble up the debris of that dying neuron. This also tells you that you shouldn't ever give a person a supplement that is purported to be an ATP supplement because ATP outside the cell is a massive signal for inflammatory activation. Okay. Now, another on signal is glutamate. Why? Because glutamate turns on the release of TNF-alpha. Now, the key thing to realize here is interleukin-1 beta and TNF-alpha are on signals. So when the brain is inflamed, you're tipping the balance brain-wide. You're tipping the balance toward a preponderance of on signals. So you've got billions of neurons and billions of microglia and billions of surveillance events every day where microglia look at neurons and say, is that a dead one? And the balance, the equation of all the on and off signals determines whether that microglial cell is going to phagocytize that neuron. And what you want is you want to quiet down the on signals so that you don't lose neurons you should not be losing. Okay, that's a pretty crucial thing, and it tells you how crucial reducing brain inflammation is. Okay, so here we see activated microglia are represented by these dark purple uh, little starbursts here, and you can see in all of these diseases, the left hand most one is Parkinson's uh, and uh, Huntington's, then you have prion disease, ALS, Alzheimer's, and then healthy brain, you can see in the healthy brain, you don't have all those activated microglia. Now, uh, microglia and neurodegenerative disease, this is nature of use neurology. Microglial phenotype is modified by systemic infection or inflammation. If the body is inflamed, if the body is infected, it can affect neuroinflammation and therefore control the way these microglial cells are behaving. So they talk about crosstalk between systemic inflammation and the microglia in the central nervous system. And that takes us back to our laundry list, that orange laundry list. All the things that can make the body inflamed can change the behavior of the microglia. Now, uh, immuno uh, immunoxidotoxicity, et cetera. This is the famous Blaylock paper, a very, very useful paper. Uh, and the point here is that systemic interleukin 1 beta in other words, systemic inflammatory activation can cause central nervous system inflammation. This is frontiers in cellular neuroscience, much the same discussion. You see on the left, sources of damage, either infection, and PAMP means pathogen-associated molecular pattern, or below that, sterile injury, where you have inflammatory process that's non-infectious. There you have damage-associated molecular patterns. You can see first on the list there is ATP, so those things drive the inflammatory process, which profoundly affects the nervous system, creates a leaky blood-brain barrier, damages neurons, activates microglia, causes dysfunction of mitochondria, and so on. So the point then is, systemic effects, whether they're inflammatory or infectious or both, have these profound central nervous system consequences. Nature of use immunology, uh, again, a single injection of lipopolysaccharide can change microglial expression. In other words, in this mouse model, if you just inject this gram-negative marker uh, into the peritoneum of these mice, their brains get inflamed. Same paper, systemic LPS injection, you get TNF expression in the brain. Remember, that's an on signal. And the microglial cells don't respond to the systemic LPS if you block TNF in the central nervous system. Same paper, microglial cells react differently 
to a pro-inflammatory stimulus uh, without the clearance of myelin debris or toxic elements from the brain. So the bottom line is that these microglial cells are at the forefront of the defense mechanisms in the brain, but that can go either way. The microglial cells should be reparative. They should repair the neurons. They should only gobble the dead ones, but they can flip over into gobbling live ones. Okay, on the other hand, if you don't have any TNF or IL-1 beta in these mice, they succumb to herpes simplex virus mediated encephalitis. So there's a balance, right? You don't want to totally shut down the immune system. That's the thing I mentioned at the beginning. You've got to have some capacity to kill pathogens or you're not going to win. Now, one of the key things about these microglial cells is that they can develop antigen presenting cell capacity. That means that they can present fragments of dead neurons to T cells that come into the brain, invade the brain, when what they should be doing, what the microglial cells should be doing, is killing those T cells. So in the periphery, in the body, neutrophils do most of the phagocytosis, macrophages do the most, well really, macrophages do most of the phagocytosis, neutrophils do only phagocytosis, dendritic cells do most of the antigen presentation. In the brain though, microglial cells do all of it. So microglial cells also do an antigen presentation because you don't really have dendritic cells in the brain. So here we have glia 2001. Uh, glial cells like uh, microglia gain antigen presenting capacity through the expression of MHC molecules, MHC major histocompatibility molecules. This is the hand with which the microglial cell hands a fragment of neuronal debris to an invading T cell. Normally those microglial cells don't have that hand structure on them, so they can't do antigen presentation. But if they shift their morphology in the context of inflammatory activation, they can begin to express genetically this hand. Now they've got the hand, they can hand a, a fragment of neuronal debris to a T cell, that's antigen presentation. That makes this microglial cell an antigen presenting cell. So just to give you an understanding of what antigen presentation is like, this is a dendritic cell. So we're talking about not the brain now, we're talking about the rest of the body. Dendritic cells hand fragments of things to T cells. And right here, you can see on the left inside the circle is that double blue bar, that's peptide MHC2. And that MHC is the hand that that dendritic cell is going to use to hand that little fragment of debris, whatever it's, whatever it's found that it wants to give to the T cell. It's gonna hand that to the T cell and the T cell will accept that with its T cell receptor. So the problem is that if you've got that capacity by microglial cells, then when T cells invade the brain, you're gonna get into trouble of autoimmune brain-based disease. So the question is, when a dendritic cell hands an antigen to a T cell, is it going to instruct the T cell to tolerate or kill that presented item? You'd like it to promote tolerance. And what kind of T cell will that invading T cell become? In autoimmunity, if it becomes a Th17 cell, that's when you're gonna have the big trouble. So, uh, this is Journal of Neuropathology and Experimental Neurology. What's supposed to happen is that when T cells invade the brain, microglial cells trigger apoptosis in those invading T cells. So, same paper. You can see here you've got the microglial cell. And when that T cell invades, you'd like that microglial cell to induce programmed cell death in the T cell. The microglial cell can also induce programmed cell death in damaged neurons. So this is kind of the, the balancing act, and all of this is going on all the time in the brain, even in normal brains. Okay, so this just talks about the mechanism by which these microglial cells are supposed to be negatively regulating T cell activation, in other words, inducing the killing of these T cells, is through this program death ligand one, and more of, more of the same. 
So normal microglia in the non-inflamed brain have a phagocytic function. They repair damaged neurons. They gobble up apoptotic neurons. In other words, neurons that are going through programmed cell death in a normal way. The microglia inhibit inflammation. They kill infectious agents and they induce apoptosis, programmed cell death, in T cells that invade the brain. But in the inflamed brain, you get excessively aggressive phagocytosis of neurons, and the microglial cells go into this antigen presentation function. So they phagocytize viable neurons. You lose neurons you shouldn't lose. The microglia express MHC2, they present fragments of neuronal debris to invading T cells, and they promote the autoimmune process in the brain. Okay, now we've got to talk about T cell polarization, okay? So this is going to give you a map of how to understand these cases. So you have some core immune dysfunctions. You have the inflammation autoimmune coactivation. Stress chemistry coactivates with inflammation. Patient has dysbiosis. Dysbiosis is a coactivator with inflammation. And virtually every patient you see is going to have some version of this clustering. Now. What happens then immunologically? And what are the consequences of that? Well, the first thing is that the more inflamed you are, the more you tend to lose innate immune response, things like natural killer cells and the efficiency of macrophage function and so on. That means that your infectious burden can increase and that's inflammatory and so that's a loop. Meanwhile, the inflammation causes programmed cell death of Th1 cells. Th1 cells are necessary to kill viruses and bacteria. Stress chemistry also causes you to lose the efficiency of your Th1 response. Well, when you lose your Th1 response, again, infection can be advantaged and dysbiosis can be advantaged. So all of this really constitutes a kind of a loop cycle, right? Meanwhile, natural killer cells and Th1 cells reinforce each other's activity. So when you drag one down, they both tend to get dragged down. Th1 loss also means that Th2 response can increase. So as Th1 goes down, Th2 goes up. Th2 response also drives and is driven by things like the inflammatory process in hollow spaces. So Th2 dominance drives things like asthma, allergies, sinusitis, upper respiratory tract infection, and urinary tract infection. But also whenever a hollow space gets inflamed, that's a promoter of Th2. So if it's a bad pollen day, if your sinuses get inflamed, it tends to push you into a TH2 dominance. Dysbiosis tends to push you into a TH2 dominance. Anything involving the epithelial lining of a hollow space, that means lungs, intestines, vaginal tract, bladder, sinuses, all of those hollow spaces, when they get inflamed, will push the person into TH2. Now, loss of TH1, increase of TH2, those things drive Th17 cell activation. That drives autoimmune tissue destruction. Meanwhile, all of the inflammation drives brain inflammation. Now, the reason that that's described as co-activation, not just body toward brain, is that when you lose the efficiency of brain function, you lose vagus motor outflow, vagal nerve motor outflow, which is profoundly anti-inflammatory. So brain inflammation can then reinforce body inflammation. Meanwhile, that laundry list of things that I mentioned before, because it drives inflammation, stirs the pot on this whole thing. Now, when you lose innate immune response and you lose Th1 response, and the infectious burden increases, that's this left side loop. Or when you lose Th1 response and Th2 response goes up, and you have these hollow space dysfunctions, and that drives TH17, and that drives autoimmunity, that's like the right side loop. Now, of course, you can have both loops, right? And needless to say, because the left side loop drives inflammation, it also drives autoimmunity. So it's not as though only the right loop drives autoimmunity, they both drive the autoimmune process. Now, let's talk about this part, which is all about the T-cell polarization. So we want to care about T-cell polarization because it determines the whole immune response, right? You need T-cell polarization to be properly functioning so you can kill infections 
in tissue and in hollow organs, and you want to quiet the autoimmune process, and you want to resolve inflammation, literally all of those agenda items depend on T-cell polarization going properly. And dysfunction of T-cell polarization drives disease process. So back to our diagram here, quick overview again. Remember, this is 2008. So in 2008, there were some things we thought we knew that we've now understood better. We thought there were four kinds of T-cells that that naive T-cell in the middle could turn into. We now know there are seven. We're going to keep talking about these four because they're still the main four for the purposes of today's discussion. So we have a naive T-cell. And depending upon the chemistry in the tissue, that determines what kind of T-cell the naive T-cell will turn into. You have a primary balance between Th17 cells and regulatory T-cells and a balance between Th1 and Th2. Remember, autoimmunity is not driven by Th1. You block STAT3, you get that naive T-cell to become a regulatory T-cell, you increase tolerance, that's good, except it's going to drag down Th1. And because Th1 turns out to be necessary to inhibit Th17, when you drag down Th1, you're going to end up with too much Th17 even though you've got regulatory T cells. So we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about how to fix that. So the Th1 response is in a coactivation with macrophages. The max make IL-12. That causes the naive T cell to become a Th1 cell. It makes interferon gamma. That turns on the MAC. And so that's a loop between macrophage activation and Th1 cell activation. Likewise, MACs turn on natural killer cells, and natural killer cells turn on MACs. So that's how you get this double loop between Th1 cells and natural killer cells. Natural killer cells are crucial for killing viruses. It's very, very important to understand when these patients have viral burdens. Herpes 1 or 2, Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, parvovirus, B19, Coxsackie virus. You've got to measure for the presence of these viruses because they can greatly increase systemic inflammation. If you don't have enough Th1 response, don't have enough natural killer cell function, then the viral burdens stay high, patient stays inflamed, and you don't win. Okay, so that's this side, right? The Th1 response, the, let me not go through that so fast. When you lose that Th1 response, your infectious burden expands and stays expanded. So you've got to be able to prop up the Th1 response. Next, Th2. Your Th2 cells... And they drive mast cell degranulation and drive eosinophil activation. On a CBC, your, C, your uh, eosinophil percentage on a CBC should be 0 or 1%, maybe 2%. But when you start getting into 3, 4, 5, 6%, that's too much TH2 dominance. Eosinophils have no housekeeping function, none. So when they're activated, it's because a TH2 response is going on. Now, Maybe the TH2 response, maybe the eosinophils are there because of a, a parasite. But the key thing is that in a hollow space, when it gets inflamed, you'll have an antiparasitic response, whether a parasite is there or not, because it's evolutionarily conserved. Okay, so here, that's the TH2 response. It's right loop stuff. And that's going to be a big driver here. But as I said, the left loop will drive autoimmunity via activation of inflammation as well. TH17 response. The normal TH17 response is to kill, to kill uh, infectious agents out of hollow spaces. So if you get a stomach flu, you should have a TH17 response, but just for a couple of days. The problem with things like dysbiosis or chronic sinusitis is that it evokes a TH17 response that goes on and on and drives the autoimmune tissue destruction and the promotion of inflammation. So American Journal of Pathology 2012, TH17 cells help you kill extracellular pathogens. That's good, except as I say, if that extracellular pathogen is chronic, like chronic candidiasis, where you're pushing TH17 all the time. TH17 response is associated with all of these autoimmune diseases and inflammatory diseases, RA, lupus, MS, psoriasis, inflammatory bowel disease, and so on. TH17 cells, drive antimicrobial peptides, again, hollow space immunity, transiently is good. And the TH17 cells drive the neutrophil response. So if you've got high neutrophils on a CBC, maybe it's just infection, but it could be driving an autoimmune flare. Okay, now, again, we saw 
neutrophilia, and all of this IL-17, 21, and 22. We talked about this before. Now you have a bit more perspective on it. So it's crucial to get this TH17 response down so that you don't have the autoimmune tissue destruction. Now, this is a crucial paper from Dritan Agoyu of Columbia. In PANDAS, the question was, how are TH17 cells getting into the brain to create the autoimmune tissue destruction in the brain? And what he found, you see the last author there is uh, Cleary PP. That's Patrick Cleary. So Patrick Cleary is the, the guy who runs Dritan Agayu's lab. And Cleary is the one who does the dissections of the mice. So you take the, you know, you do a sort of a bowl haircut dissection, you pop the top of the skull off, you take the brain out. And they couldn't find where these TH17 cells were getting into them, into the brains of these mice. So Cleary said, you know, when I take the brain out, the olfactory tract at the front breaks off. Right? You can imagine a mouse, you pull the brain out, you have this olfactory tract by the nose, but it breaks off. And so he says, I'm, I'm not getting the olfactory tract in these dissections. How about if I do a very careful dissection and preserve the olfactory tract? So it turns out that when they did that, what they found was that the CD4 positive TH17 cells were predominantly located in the olfactory bulb. In other words, these TH17 cells are coming from the sinuses and they're migrating along the olfactory tract into the brain. So it's crucial in PANDAS patients, they are not allowed to have sinus problems. You've got to aggressively go after their sinus problems. Okay, uh, by the way, one of the things that um, I was asked to mention is there is a course called Cogence Immunology, C-O-G-E-N-C-E, -E, immunology.com. You can go there, you can join. There's not a fee for joining because it's now sponsored uh, by Pure Encapsulations. And if you go there and join, you will see a tab uh, called Tools. And if you click on the Tools tab and you uh, click on the Sinus Protocol, you'll see a nebulizer protocol that will help you with clearing out the sinuses of these kids. Okay, so now let's talk about the TH1 role here because it turns out the TH1 cells inhibit TH17 cells. And I'll show you how that works. So remember you have this primary balance here and you block SAT3 and you have this naive T cell becoming a regulatory, a regulatory T cell promoting immune tolerance, but it dumps the TH1 response. And the problem then is you'll get too much TH17. You won't win when you promote regulatory T cells. So remember, as of 08, we thought autoimmunity was TH1. It's not, and here's why. Here's the TH1 cell. Here's the receptor on the cell membrane for a TH1 cell. Here's a TH17 cell. Here's the receptor on the cell membrane for a TH17 cell. Do you see how the right side is the same? between the TH1 cell and the TH17 cell. That's why we thought they were the same. So throughout the immunology world, what, what we had was, we had a group of cells that was a mix of TH1 and TH17, and we called the whole thing TH1. And we said, TH1 cells create destruction in the autoimmune process. But later it was realized that the other side of the receptor is not the same. So at that point we said, oh, this isn't one group of cells called TH1 doing the destruction. This is two groups of cells, one of which is the Th1 cell, one of which is the Th17 cell. The Th17 cell is doing the destruction, and it turns out the Th1 cell is blocking the destruction. So we used to think it was one group. We called the whole thing Th1, and we blamed autoimmune tissue destruction on Th1 because it was the group. Now, I showed you this before, Th17 cells uh, drive the autoimmune tissue destruction. And again, you've got to make sure hollow spaces are clear so you're not evoking chronic TH17 cell activation. TH1 cells, this is Nature Medicine 07. TH1 cells do not sustain or play a decisive role in the commonly studied models of autoimmunity. Instead, it's interleukin 17 made by TH17 cells. And it turns out the TH1 pathway antagonizes antagonizes the TH17 pathway. That's a core thing. TH1 pathway antagonizes TH17. How does that work? 
American Journal of Pathology. You see at the top, IL-21, IL-6, IL-23. They signal the activation of STAT-3. Now in the nucleus of the cell, STAT-3 turns on genes that turn on this thing called ROR-C. In mice, it's called ROR-gamma-T. In humans, it's called ROR-C. ROR-C, in turn, turns on these genes, which turn on these nasty tissue-destructive cytokines we've been talking about. How would you block that? Well, interferon gamma, a classic Th1 cytokine, turns on T-bet. T-bet blocks the ROR-C expression of those nasty inflammatory cytokines. So if you zoom in, it looks like this. Here's the T-bet, and it blocks the ROR-C gene expression. So literally, Th1 activation blocks that cell from expressing its Th17 cytokines. And recognize these cells are in a constant state of flux between these states. It's not like a Th17 cell sits there like a blob and a different cell goes and affects it. We're talking about this very same cell where you're vying for the extent to which it's expressing itself as a Th1 cell or as a Th17 cell. If you can shift it morphologically toward being a Th1 cell and away from being a Th17 cell, shift its behavior, then you don't get those Th17 cytokines. Here we have Nature Immunology 2012. Here's a Th1 cell and the Tbet that's in it, blocking Th2 and the same Th1 cell blocking Th17. So that's the crucial take home message. Th1 cells block Th17. The key thing then is the Th1 cells also are profoundly antimicrobial. And this is how you have your cake and eat it too. This is how you have a Th1 response dampening autoimmune process and inhibiting pathogen burden. So when you lose Th1 and or when Th2 is too high, Th17 cell expression can go forward and you get autoimmunity. So when you want to downregulate autoimmunity, you want to bring up Th1, you want to bring down Th2. Okay, you're trying to dampen that right side loop. Okay, interestingly, Journal of Neuroinflammation 2011, successful resolution of Lyme neuroborreliosis requires a strong Th1 response followed by a quieting Th2 response. When everything is working well, the pendulum moves back and forth in various ways, but ultimately the flexibility to respond and to then get resolution by moving back toward neutral, that's intact in people for whom the problem, excuse me, the problem doesn't persist. But the, the proper choreography that leads to resolution, excuse me, depends on the TH1 response as the first move. So early neuroborreliosis is dominated by a TH1 type response. That's when it goes well. That's when it goes well. Here we have a very interesting paper on rheumatoid arthritis. What these authors did was they looked at these hybrid Th1, Th17 cells. They wanted to understand which rheumatoid arthritis patients did better and which ones did worse. And they found that Th1 cells in rheumatoid arthritis patients were fewer in the healthy group, sorry, fewer than the healthy group. And negatively correlated with disease activity. In other words, the more Th1 cells you had, the less disease activity you had. The fewer Th1 cells you had, the more disease activity you had. So in these cells that are vying for whether they're going to be Th1 cells or Th17 cells, if you can get them to be Th1 cells, the patient does much better. So here in a kind of a classic autoimmune disease model, you see that the promotion of adequacy of Th1 yields you quieter disease process. And this is where things seem to be moving in the immunology world is the realization of the usefulness of Th1 in quieting autoimmune disease, and you will absolutely see this in a clinical setting as well. So, okay, application summary. You have this laundry list. The laundry list drives inflammation, which drives autoimmune coactivation. 
stress chemistry coactivates with inflammation, as does dysbiosis. And the problem with things like dysbiosis or sinusitis and so on is that they drive Th17 cell activation, which worsens autoimmunity. Meanwhile, infection drives both inflammation and autoimmunity. We know that infection is an instigator of new autoimmunity. So this is an entanglement, right? If you go back to our map, anything that increases the laundry list increases inflammation, which increases brain inflammation. Meanwhile, stress chemistry and dysbiosis make it worse too. Infection makes it worse too. The key is that if you can bring Th1 response up, you can create advantages by breaking up both the left and right side loops. But the problem is that low Th1 response is a consequence of inflammation and stress chemistry. And you also lose innate immune response. And that lets the whole process get worse. You end up with excessive Th2 response. And by the way, there are some people who are Th2 dominant just lifelong, right? These are the people who had uh, tubes in their ears and, you know, tonsils out and allergic to the environment and so on. So when Th2 response goes up, that makes it even more likely Th17 response will go up. Autoimmunity gets pushed by both the right side loop and the left side loop. And of course, autoimmunity in the case of uh, encephalitic processes yields brain autoimmunity. Now, Th1 response is the key to the whole thing. And what we need to do is drive up Th1 response. Now, let's look at a very simplified model. We know that inflammation and chronic infection drive each other. Here, here's an example, even from the cardiology literature about that. We know that you lose innate immune response and Th1 response. Meanwhile, we know that inflammation and autoimmunity drive each other. And we know that you lose Th1 response, you gain Th2 response, and Th17 response also goes up. So that's a very, very boiled down version that really gives you the punchline as well. Now, meanwhile, we know that infection is also an instigator of new autoimmunity. So if you take away nothing else but this diagram, you're way ahead of the game. Now, what we wanna do is we wanna boost up Th1 response. We wanna boost up innate immune response. We wanna bring down infection. We wanna bring down dysbiosis. We wanna bring down inflammatory process. We wanna bring down Th2 response. Bring down Th17 response, bring down autoimmunity, and of course, brain inflammation. Now, one step is this one. And then among the directly immunological mechanisms, although of course all of this is immunology, right? We wanna bring up Th1, we wanna bring down Th2, we wanna bring up innate immune response. And we'll talk briefly at the very, very end, we're almost at the end now, about how to do that. Those are the four moves. We've gotta reduce the inflammation autoimmune coactivation, we've gotta bring up Th1, we've gotta bring up innate immune response, we've gotta bring down Th2. Now, there's a crucial mistake. And the mistake is that everybody wants to reduce the inflammation first, right? Everybody wants to do this part first. Block STAT3 with curcumin and resveratrol. Get that naive T cell to become a TH, uh, T regulatory cell to promote immune tolerance. So you want to give curcumin and resveratrol, A, D, fish oil. You can't go wrong with curcumin and fish oil, right? How could that be bad? Well, you got to do that second. You can't do it first. And here's why. You see the TGF beta there that helps that naive T cell become a regulatory T cell. And then the regulatory T cell makes even more TGF beta. So when you promote tolerance, there'll be a lot of TGF beta around. But you'll see on labs, when you draw TGF beta, transforming growth factor beta one, when you draw the blood to see what the level of that is, oftentimes it's super high. Now here's the risk. Here you have a naive T cell and a dendritic cell that's going to instruct it. What kind of instruction it gets depends on things interestingly like the vitamins in the tissue environment, histamine levels, the other cytokines, and so on. All of that determines what instructions that dendritic cell is going to give the naive T cell. The instructions are given with these differentiation cytokines, 
that that dendritic cell gives to the naive T cell to tell it what kind of T cell to turn into. That T cell then makes these effector cytokines that have these functions. So you see that row of T cells across the bottom, the purple T cells. Those T cells are what the naive T cell could turn into, those six plus regulatory T cells. Here's the risk. A lot of these patients are TH2 dominant because TH2 dominance is driven by loss of TH1, driven by inflammation, stress. It turns out that mold exposure promotes TH2. It turns out that exposure to pesticides depletes TH1, therefore promotes TH2. It turns out that uh, other kinds of factors that you commonly see, like certain kinds of pathogens themselves, like candida, promoting TH2. A variety of factors drive TH2 dominance. By the way, blue light inhibits TH1. So these kids who are on screens constantly lose TH1 response. So for a whole variety of reasons, chief among them chronic inflammation and stress, there's a likelihood that this patient is TH2 dominant. Now, that means that that patient is going to have a lot of interleukin-4 around. That naive T cell is going to be turning into a TH2 cell. That TH2 cell is making even more interleukin-4. So interleukin-4 is in this kind of loop cycle perpetuating TH2 dominance. But the problem is that interleukin-4 also, when there's transforming growth factor beta around, can drive the production of what are called TH9 cells. TH9 cells are like the nastier cousin of TH2 cells. And what they create is a huge amount of inflammation. So if you promote tolerance first and create even higher levels of TGF beta in a patient who's got a lot of interleukin-4 around, the problem is you're going to drive them into a TH9 response and drive more tissue inflammation. So what you have to do first is down-regulate TH2 so they don't have so much interleukin-4. Then you can promote immune tolerance as step two, not as step one. So you have to avoid driving excessive tissue inflammation. Okay, coming to the end. So if they're autoimmune, then you have to inhibit the NF-kappa B STAT3 axis. You have to support TH1 and modulate TH2. That brings down the autoimmunity. If they're infected, you have to support TH1 and support innate immune response and inhibit TH2. And you have to avoid the key mistake of inhibiting NF-kappa B STAT3 axis and promoting tolerance in a patient who's TH2 dominant. You've got to down-regulate the TH2 dominance first. All right, how do you do all this stuff? Well, here it is. Inhibiting NF-kappa B and STAT3 coactivation is done with resveratrol, curcumin, sulforaphane, quercetin, black ginger, vitamin D, vitamin A. We have rolled most of this, except the A, we've rolled most of this into something called balanced immune. Balanced immune is a pure encapsulations product that encompasses all the rest of what's on that list. The resveratrol, curcumin, sulforaphane, quercetin, and black ginger. It's aimed at inhibiting that NF-kappa B STAT3 loop. Next is supporting TH1, which is done with berberine, bicalin, ginger, and sulforaphane. Not surprisingly, that's a product called TH1 support. Essentially the shortest product naming meeting ever. Um, so Pure Encapsulations has been kind enough to uh, allow me to design these things based on these couple of decades worth of work. Um, uh, so that it's easier for clinicians to just have an application that is, you know, four things instead of 20 things. So TH1 support is all of those things. You want to support the innate immune response, and in particular, natural killer cell activation with astragalus, andrographis, and reishi. Reishi is also called Ganoderma, and that's your innate immune response support. And then down regulation of TH2 is done with something called TH2 modulator. And TH2 modulator is perilla, astragalus, and acetylcysteine and quercetin. And that's going to introduce a reduction of TH2 by inhibiting interleukin-4 and by lowering the histamine level. So the bottom line then is you want to start your first step with TH2 modulation, 
and with support for TH1 using the TH2 modulator and TH1 support. And then a week or so into it, or maybe 10 days into it, you can start balanced immune to quiet down that NF-kappa B STAT3 axis. The innate immune support can go in in the beginning as well. Okay, uh, glad to take questions, I think, in person, which is going to be after the time of the recording. Oh, and the last thing is, remember, if you want to study more of this, you can go to uh, cogenceimmunology.com and sign up for the course. Okay, glad to take questions.